today. And that's also been uh, taken seriously by a lot of the uh, organizations. I was part of a CDC guidelines. We worked for four years to come up with a surgical site infection. WHO has also just published their guidelines. And then there's also been some recommendation from the previous uh, international consensus meeting. So the, the, um, uh, the recommendations of the CDC was based on level one studies, and that's what we were trying to do, which is unlike the prior CDC guidelines that was based purely on uh, expert opinion. But what we discovered during the process of four years was that there's very little science behind most of the things we do in medicine, and particularly in orthopedics. And that's why the consensus meeting got together to try to come up with some recommendations. WHO, in a very hasty manner, got together and uh, came up with their surgical site uh, prevention guidelines over a period of four months. I was part of that guideline initially, but I decided not to pursue it because I think WHO has made a couple of very dangerous recommendations, which I will share with you in a, in a few seconds. So. In, in this 10 minutes, it's very difficult for me to give you everything about prevention of surgical side infection. What I will do is I will concentrate on, uh, on strategies that are proven to be effective or are important. And if you're not doing that, you should probably be implementing it. First, if you're doing total joint arthroplasty, you should make sure your patients have skin decontamination. Have some sort of a policy in place where your patients shower with either betadine or chlorhexidine or they have chlorhexidine wipes prior to uh, coming to the, uh, to the hospital. This reduces the bio burden on the skin and has been proven on numerous, numerous, numerous studies to be very effective. Ask your patients not to shave until they come to the hospital and you need to do the shaving right before the surgical incision and preferably with clippers and not blades. So again, you will see both WHO, CDC, as well as the International consensus recommend for the use of CHG, soap, wipe, or even betadine shower. Very important step. And as you see here, it says full body, not just the surgical site, not the knee, the hip, the full body, because that reduces uh, the bio burden on the skin. Hand washing, we don't know what the most effective agent is at the moment, and we don't even know how long you should be washing your hands but preferably two minutes, clean your nails in the morning at least for the first time. Make sure you wash with antiseptic. And at my institution, we also do terminal cleaning with alcohol. So after you washed some alcohol on your hands before you put the gloves on. Surgical site preparation, what do you use to so prepare the skin? It really doesn't matter as long as alcohol is part of it. And I know some of you probably read the uh, article by Darius in the England Journal of Medicine where he showed chlorhexidine was superior. The biggest flaw with that study is that he was using chlorhexidine with alcohol in one arm and aqueous betadine in the other arm. So he was really comparing two versus one. So at this point, there is no difference. If you're using chlorhexidine, continue to use it. If you're using betadine, continue to use it. But make sure alcohol is absolutely part of it. Antiseptic prophylaxis against CDC, category 1A recommendation that alcohol must be part of your prophylaxis. Contaminations happen in the operating room, and if you are one of those careful surgeons, you should probably re-scrub the skin after you've done the, uh, the draping. We usually do that as well before we uh, make the incision. Operating room environment is a commonly asked question. I get emails on this almost two or three times a week. Honestly, this is, it's not very important whether you operate in an amnar floor room or you don't. In fact, WHO, dangerous recommendation, tells you that you shouldn't be operating in a laminar air floor room. And they're using two registry papers to argue in their favor. But what is important that you must have positive pressure ventilation system in your operating room. And it's very important that you have the dirty and the clean setup very differently and you have to have types of room that allows you for to, to, to seal the uh, uh, operating room and the room opening should be minimized as much as possible. So this is Gary Hooper's work. I like Gary a lot. He's a great friend. I visited New Zealand multiple times and this study showed that the use of laminar airflow led to a higher incidence of infection in the patient population. 
Registry data is very dangerous to uh, do studies related to infection because it does not include granular data. In fact, if you've uh, visited uh, New Zealand, you'll know that the laminar airflow is used in academic centers where the residents and fellows are doing the operation, where complex cases are being performed, where there are visitors, where there is more air traffic, and the list goes on. So none of those things could be taken into account, and hence that type of a finding is dangerous to publish out there. And in fact, it is so dangerous that he is recommending, or in fact one of the findings is that the use of antibiotic impregnated cement leads to a higher incidence of infection in B British Journal publication. So that just tells you the fact that they are not able to look at the granularity of the data because all registry, obviously Scandinavia, meta-analyses, etc., all show that addition of antibiotics to cement reduces the incidence of infection. If you're not a believer in that, which you may not be, and I will have no issue with that, it, it does not add to the infection burden. Again, who uses antibiotic impregnated cement? Probably most of the time used in complex cases, patients with prior septic arthritis, complex conversions, et cetera, et cetera. So registry data, be very careful reading registry data and making recommendations or policy changes at your institution. But what is important is it cl it's clear that the number of cycles in the room and how effective the ventilation system is is going to lead to a reduction in the number of air particles. The number of particles in the operating room is going to translate to a higher incidence of infection. That's not debated. That's accepted fact. So how do you reduce the number of aerosolized particles in the operating room? You need to have OR fitted with at least 350 to 500 cycles and make sure you reduce traffic and make sure you reduce door opening. So this is a simulated study that we did at my institution. We had every 15 minutes one person walk into the room, total of nine people. We had the laminar airflow or the ventilation system turned off, and we had the ventilation system back to basic, which is 100 cycles. The top graph shows you when, what happens when you turn off the laminar airflow. The number of particles goes up with each person entering the room. The bottom is the graph when you have the ventilation system working. But there will come a point when you will overwhelm or your ventilation system if you have too many people in the operating room. And for us, we found that that happens to be 12 people in the operating room. And you look around you when you're operating, the number of people around you is going to translate to a higher number of aerosolized particles, some of which are bacteria. Antimicrobial, still cephalosporins, is the best antibiotics to be given to your total joint arthroplasty patients. And it needs to be weight-based, 15 milligram per kilogram. If you're operating on obese patients, you might have to give up to three grams of cephalosporins. It needs to be given within one hour. That's CDC's recommendation also. Another dangerous recommendation from WHO that you should give it within two hours. That's not adequate. Two hours, it's not going to have enough bioavailability I have no idea why they've made that recommendation, but you should definitely give it within one hour. Do not administer additional prophylactic antimicrobial agents after the surgical incision is closed. 1A, recommendation from CDC telling us that one antibiotic is enough. This is being debated heavily in the United States. AAHKS just published, we put a, a, a statement on the website saying that at this point the evidence for total joint arthroplasty is not there. Continue to do what you think is right for your patients, but AHKS is a sponsor of the randomized prospective study that will continue to, uh, uh, to be um, uh, collecting data and hopefully will address the question for us as to whether we need three doses or one dose. At this point, unknown. They are recommending against the prolongation antimicrobial prophylaxis. CDC does not like the idea of you putting antimicrobial agents like ointments, solutions, powder on the incision, and they definitely do not like the idea of you pouring vancomycin into the wound. And we can debate it and talk about it if you want, but the literature for pouring vancomycin into wound is very, very scant and not proper. Why? Well, the greatest threat to the human civilization after Donald Trump is probably the rise of antimicrobial resistance. And if we are not careful, 
this is going to kill more people than cancer by the year 2050. And a uh, British government published a very, very frightening article about AMR. AMR is on the rise. In the United States now we're seeing E. coli and Staph aureus that are pan resistant to every known antibiotic that we have. And this could kill up to million and a half to two million in South America and North America alone in the coming year. So very scary. And the major reason for the rise of AMR is the use of antibiotics in food industry and animal husbandry. 50 tons of antibiotics used in the United States per day. Majority of that in that type of area. But, uh, but I think as doctors, we also need to exercise antibiotic stewardship, make sure that we take, take our responsibility seriously and not use antibiotics unless that's absolutely necessary. Normothermia, you can maintain uh, temperature. For those of you from Britain, I know that you've seen uh, articles coming out showing the forced air warming may be associated with higher incidence of infection. That's not proven to be the case. In fact, multiple studies um, refute that finding, and those findings are all simulated studies mostly. And again, uh, whatever you do doesn't matter. You have to keep normothermia in the operating room. And that's, again, category 1A. And these are important for us in the United States because whatever CDC says becomes a policy. And if your hospital does not implement these policies, you are out of line and it could have financial penalty as well as others. Inside draping, another one of those silly uh, recommendations from WHO saying you should not use inside draping. I don't know if you use inside draping or you don't, but if you use it, it uh, should be iodine impregnated inside draping because you need some sort of an antibacterial. Uh, during the procedure. We believe the skin recolonizes during the procedure and adhesive draping is good to isolate the sterile versus non-sterile. You see in a knee, for example, manipulation results in the movement of the drapes and the drapes unfortunately expose the non-sterile part and that's not good for you. And in fact, we did a study on my FAO patients where we had 101 patients uh, uh, randomized to two groups when we took skin cultures at uh, five different time points. And what we found was when you used Iaban, the terminal cultures were positive 12% of the time for organisms. And when you didn't use Iaban, almost two and a half, three times as high contamination risk. So there is a contamination risk when you don't use them. Wound irrigation, CDC recommends for the use of aqueous iodine. We talked about this yesterday. It is important that the iodine you use is a sterile. You can't use those topical bottles that sit on the side of the operating room that we use for skin cleansing. They have to be sterile, and unfortunately, that's an issue in the United States right now. We don't have a sterile betadine anymore, but it should be 0.3%. You should leave it in the wood for three minutes, but make sure that you wash it at the end of the procedure. Again, here you are. It's a category two, but it says, I, the fourth solution for prevention of surgical site infection. And there are actually numerous studies, including 11 randomized control studies showing that iodine is better than normal saline. And part of the problem I have with vancomycin powder studies is that they don't have a control arm. And what if vancomycin powder against betadine? And that would be a good study to perform, and I bet you the betadine would win. So issues not addressed in the CDC guidelines, they are the others, is that there is definitely a direct correlation between surgical site infection and patients who have renal disease, chronic liver disease, chronic anemia. In particular, anemia is really worrisome. Obesity predisposes the patients to more complications, including surgical site infection and periprosthetic joint infection. The actual limit in BMI is not known, but most of us believe that the risk starts to exponentially increase after BMI 40. And this is particularly true if your obese patients also have other elements of metabolic syndrome, which includes hyperlipidemia, uh, hypertension, diabetes, or hyperglycemia. So if these patients had, like the patient that Klaus showed this morning, you should make sure that their metabolic syndrome is addressed. And in fact, we wrote a paper back in 2008 showing that the patients with uncontrolled metabolic syndrome, I was very impressed that class remember that number, it actually 13% risk for infection. So uncontrolled metabolic syndrome is really dangerous. You should make sure patients have that addressed prior to undergoing surgery. Smoking has not been addressed, but increased uh, uh, smoking, in particular heavy smoking, does increase the risk. 
And if you are going to be implementing smoke and cessation, you should really do that at least four to six weeks. It is probably not effective if you ask them to stop smoking on Friday and you do their surgery on Monday. But stopping smoking is really, uh, really good. So excessive alcohol consumption coming up from a night in the Italian restaurant last night with all those bottles of wine going around. Excessive alcohol consumption is unfortunately a risk factor for increased surgical site infection. And again, a beautiful study by Tonus and Mack and BMJ 1999 shows that a uh, randomized study that uh, alcohol consumption increases the risk. And again, cessation should probably be about four to, four to, we, four to six weeks beforehand. So tomorrow is the uh, Super Bowl in the, in the United States and uh, Eagles, where we support and where their team doctors will be hopefully kicking uh, Patriots' ass. Thank you very much. <laughs>